Thanks to Raycom for sponsoring this video. Oh, good lord, Nero. If you're not actually going to wear your headphones and maybe you're looking in the wrong place, my dude, get yourself some Raycons everyday earbuds. Co-founded by Ray J and endorsed by other well-renowned celebrities like Snoop Dogg, Melissa Etheridge, Rich the Kid, and even Mike Tyson. Raycons looking to make great sounds for everyone while keeping your wallet full. Their Bluetooth wireless earbuds start at half the price of other premium audio brands out there. I mean, good god. Each pair also comes with over 8 hours of playtime, 32 hour total battery life thanks to the rechargeable carrying case, a healthy selection of colors to choose from, not to mention a 30 day free return policy if you're not fully convinced. You can also tap the earbud to toggle between customizable sound profiles or activate noise isolation and awareness mode. For a few years now, I've been using my Raycon for workout sessions and grocery trips, but in the summer weather, I also just like using them for morning walks. It's very very relaxing for me and if you're thinking about getting a pair yourself raycon as always is offering all my viewers a great deal so click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash some call me johnny to save 15 percent off your next raycon purchase doing so really helps support this channel but i appreciate your consideration anyway anyway let's continue on with the show Hey, hello, yes, <laughs> I am still alive. I'm so sorry for the wait on this one. It's been a busy couple of weeks with the TMG prep and fallout. Uh, we relaunched SGB. Uh, I mean, a lot of folks happy and I'm really happy to see that. Uh, you can catch the channel up there on the card up top. SGB likes to play. We're back and uh, I hope you guys like what we have in store for you guys in the future. But uh, and from this point forward, I don't have any other conventions or things for the remainder of the year. So it should be relatively smooth sailing from this point onward until the end of the year. So why don't we continue where we left off? And yes, I am coming at you with my live stream setup. I originally did have this all recorded with the regular camera, but my dumbass forgot to compensate for the low lighting and it came out way grainier than it's used to. So it'd just be faster and easier to just redo everything from this setup and not have to worry about hogging up my GPU trying to get rid of grain. It's a pain in the ass. And uh, d don't, don't be dumb like me. Now it's time for the fourth entry of the Devil May Cry series, and this one, like, I didn't know what to expect heading into this, because even though I'm surrounded by a bunch of DMC fans in my circle, I don't hear folks talk about this one. It's the first Devil May Cry to go multi-platform, the first DMC for the seventh generation of consoles, that's all good, but the only thing that came to my mind when I hear Devil May Cry 4, it's, oh hey, it's one of the first commentaries we ever canceled over on Brain Scratch commentaries. I wonder why. Hot off the big success of Dante's Awakening on the PlayStation 2, Devil May Cry was a bona fide franchise for Capcom by now. The games were selling well and Dante was getting some extra spotlight in other forms of media to boot, crossing over with other games including Beautiful Joe, Shimigami Tensei, a couple of mangas here and there, light novels, even a whole ass anime released in 2007. Devil May Cry was in business and business was looking good. Capcom was locked on sites for the next generation and for some of their earliest games they figured a new Devil May Cry game was the right choice to make. In fact, Devil May Cry 4 would not only begin development right after the third game was completed, but it would also be one of Capcom's first titles released for this generation, next to Dead Rising, which I believe was a launch window game, or at least within a year of the release of the 360 anyway. And then there was Lost Planet, the game I know nothing about other than the giant mech getting a character slot in Tatsunoko vs. Capcom. <laughs> Hideaki Atsuno returned as director once again, I think at this point he's proven that he can make a seriously amazing action game when given the time and resources needed. Also returning was Bingo Morihashi, certainly no stranger to the series, he's been involved since DMC2 and that whole fiasco, this was the guy that ended up coughing blood because of how crushed DMC2's development was by the way. But you know, he helped with that game, he wrote the scenario for the third game, and this one we're about to head into. But to my shock, circumstances involving the development of this game would lead the man to straight up quitting Capcom before he was asked to come back by Hideaki Atsuno to help finish the project. Good lord, Hideaki Atsuno was probably like, no, 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 come back, please come back, please, 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 please. I know, I know it was rough with DMC2, I know this is also giving you shit, but please, let's just bear with it, and let's just get something that can make folks happy, and then you do whatever the hell you want afterwards. And sure enough, like, after DMC4's completion, Mingo Morihashi would would just leave Capcom and you know pursue other things. Now from what I've looked up, while the development of Devil May Cry 4 wasn't as, uh, what's the word to put it, uh, 
inhumane as DMC2, this game had its own share of bullshit to deal with despite having a team of over 80 people working on it. Regarding production, it seems the team had around the same budget as Dante's Awakening, but Capcom wanted something larger, something better, something to showcase what they could do with the new hardware using the same budget as a PS2 title. And while I'm sure this would have been easier done than said if the devs were just working on one system, Devil May Cry 4 was going multi-platform, and one of those platforms was the PlayStation 3, which in the mid-2000s, nobody knew how to fucking make a game for it because of its radically different architecture compared to the much more approachable Xbox 360, Red Ring of Death Be Damned. Still, it looks like they made it work out, and I'd like to assume Devil May Cry 4 on the PlayStation 3 works just as well as the Xbox 360 version, but this is assuming you're even playing the original release today, which I don't think folks are doing. They're probably playing the special edition released in... 2015, good lord, June of 2015, that's about seven years after the original game. Why the sudden interest in revisiting it? Actually, uh, don't answer that. I think I might find the answer for myself after the next video. Oh boy. The team also wanted to put emphasis on new blood for this adventure. Dante had his fun. In fact, I think he's still trapped somewhere in the underworld based on the ending of DMC2, so let's give the spotlight to someone new. That someone will end up being this dude named Nero who I guess looks different enough from Dante. I don't know, I blur my eyes and I swear I'm just looking at DMC3 Dante with a glowy arm and a higher polygon count. Also voiced by a former Power Ranger here, Johnny Young Bosch in this case. You know what, happy to see him here. I think he's a fucking fantastic voice actor altogether and this game is no exception. I love his performance in this. Guy just came from hell. He's gotta hit up a couple to his side. Do you think it's intentional at this point recruiting former Power Ranger staff as voice actors for this franchise? Ruben Langdon was a stuntman in the series for a bit. Uh, Dan Southworth, the voice of Virgil, was the Quantum Ranger in Time Force. Johnny Young Bosch was the second Black Ranger in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers lineup. God, and I remember catching that live too. That was way back in 1994, I believe. Like 30 years next year. Oof. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like for the last couple of videos, I've been, I've been getting pretty existential about how much time has actually gone past. What the fuck am I doing with myself? In the eyes of the development team, Nero would attract newcomers to the series, pick up the controller, play their first Devil May Cry game, maybe make them a fan and try out the other games. That was at least the original idea. And in retrospect, I still think Nero fills that role quite nicely, I thought. But during development, producer Hiroyuki Kobayashi voiced concern over the lack of the series' wacky woohoo pizza man. Fearing a negative response like what Raiden experienced in Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, catch that review here on the card up top, nudge nudge, Mr. Kobayashi would not give the final approval of Nero unless Dante was worked into the game in some form or fashion. The result of this we will no fucking doubt get into, but fans could rest easy knowing that despite having a new face take over the role as main protagonist this time, Dante still had a large role to play and he was still full of energy and snark and not that stone statue from DMC2. Confirming what I initially said that DMC3 was essentially a rewrite of the character and one I'm fully glad to see come back. Even if I don't fully agree with his look and attire in this game, I don't know, there's something about his Giga Chad face I don't really vibe with, his hair looks like a bad wig, and what's with those cowboy chaps and red boots? Take that shit off, Dante, you look like an asshole. But okay, as I'm getting ready to head into the game proper, I'll be playing the special edition from this off of Steam. I figured that was just the best version to play today in 2023. Just as a heads up for full transparency, I bought the special bundle that was on sale for like 30 bucks at the time. You see, I figured when they say bundle, they meant like, you know, extra DLC, maybe some extra costumes, some extra side campaigns. I didn't know what was all in like within the DMC4 package. So I figured, all right, just get 30 bucks for the bundle and let's just play everything that's in it. But what I also didn't know is that it came with a bunch of red orbs and proud souls. So those are currency in the game to buy upgrades or items in the shop. And it not only unlocks every mode and every difficulty, but like every costume as well. It is essentially a 100% safe file, or at least uh, close enough to it. And I would normally not purchase something like that because I'd rather just unlock all that stuff within the game itself via multiple playthroughs. But uh, at this point, I'm kind of whatever about it because it's not like I'm immediately replaying this one after I finish. I got two other games to tackle after this. So if it's less grinding I got to do, then sure, why not? Uh, I already spent the money, so let's just keep going. Anyway, uh, what did I ultimately think of Devil May Cry 4? In the island of Fortuna, there exists a religious group known as the Order, who worship the legendary Dark Knight Sparta as if he was some kind of god. Within the group are these knights known as the Order of the Sword, who carry out the will of the Sanctus for the sake of peace and prosperity and all that other bullshit. Jesus this, Moses that, 
Abraham hit me with a wiffle ball bat. We find our new hero of the day, Nero, rushing to attend an opera performance where his girlfriend Kitty is getting top billing for, but he's sort of caught up in killing demons that tend to pop in from time to time, for he's also a knight for the Order of the Sword. Still, he's able to make it and catches the end of the show, but I see that Nero is one of those assholes that despite having headphones, he doesn't actually wear them and has the music on loud enough to annoy everyone else around him. What a prick. But suddenly Dante enters the scene, likely to show the consequences of not practicing good music listening etiquette Nero, and proceeds to murder the Sanctus of the Order right in front of everyone watching, causing chaos to erupt from within the sacred walls of the church. Nero attempts to stop Dante and can keep up with him for a bit, but Dante is clearly holding back and makes his exit, leaving Nero to give chase by order of Credo, the captain of the Holy Knights and brother of Nero's girlfriend Kyrie. However, not all is as it seems, if that wasn't very obvious at this point, and I realize we're only like 10 minutes into the game here, but as Nero begins his hunt for Dante, it turns out the Order is not exactly the holy visage they claim to be. The Sanctus is revealed to be alive and well, looking a little more demonic on top of that too. Somebody get this man some clear eye. It gets redness, dryness, irritation, out. A triple play. Wow. The Sanctus secretly wants ultimate power for himself, stop me if you heard that one before, siphoning the power of demons to not only create an army fit for any crusade and to eventually power this ginormous statue named Jubilate, I mean the savior, he is also augmenting and empowering his own soldiers with demonic powers, mainly thanks to the assistance of his scientist named Agnes, who someone in my Discord referred to as Alolan Senator Armstrong, and thanks for that because now I can't unsee that shit. Using the power of a broken Yamato as a power source, originally the katana belonging to Virgil, the order is positively brimming with demonic influence, and Nero is gonna learn the hard way that he's gonna have to do some serious Devil May Cry shit if he wants to make it out alive and protect the ones he loves, namely his girlfriend Kirie. Really loves that girl. As for Dante, nothing really complicated about why he's here, he wants the Yamato back, claiming that it belongs to the family and is too dangerous to be left in the hands of anyone else. Though he and Nero originally start on bad terms, the two will eventually reconcile their differences as the true nature of the Order comes to light. And that's about the basic gist of the game's story, it's pretty cut and dry and... Well, it's rather bare. <laughs> it's pretty damning for me when one of the first things that come out of my mouth when the credits started rolling was, Okay, but who the fuck was this guy? <laughs> we learn... Next to nothing about Nero in his own debut. You know, we, we get pieces of things here and there, but no time is spent like being introspective about it or developing it to make it more worthwhile. His only sense of agency is that he's revealed to be a descendant of Sparta himself. Oh, okay. So did the Sparta have like a secret love child somewhere? Perhaps he's the hidden third brother of Dante or Virgil. We got a solid snake situation here, or maybe he, he's one of their kids. I don't know, the game quickly drops the whole Sparta thing as soon as it's mentioned. Dante doesn't react to it, that other posse reacts to it, it's treated more as uh, trivia than anything. Personally, I think it's pretty obvious that Nero is likely Virgil's child. Later in the game when confronting Agnes, the broken Yamato not only reforms to help Nero, but it also helps awaken Nero's devil trigger. Come on, I don't think you do that unless you mean to say there's a deeper connection here than just Nero being another white-haired demon slayer with a glowy arm. Unfortunately, our souls are at odds, brother. I need more power. And it would my heart changed. What is it called? Power. Give me more power. Also, Virgil fucked? I never got the idea that he was remotely interested in Poontang. I thought he was just interested in Peg and Dante. Uh, who did he lay with? I, I remember the opening of his cutscene that he gets in his campaign, which is like a prologue to the whole story's events, taking a place like, I think, two decades before. Uh, there's this slight focus on this woman in red, and it's like, I, I'm assuming uh, Virgil laid with her at, at some point or another. I, like, he, Virgil fucked. I. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't to say I didn't like Nero or the others, no, in fact, I like the characters in the story. I just didn't think the story was anything special. I think Nero's girlfriend Kirie could have used more screen time, she's too much of a damsel in distress for my liking. I think it doesn't help that every other female in this series so far has shown to be capable of defending themselves, and uh, here's Kirie and her only quality is that she's a great singer. To be fair, that is a quality. It's just, compared to everything else we've seen, kinda milk toast. I totally buy that she and Nero are a thing though, and my god, the way Nero calls out to her when she's in dire straits, okay, yeah, I get that these two are in love with each other again. Johnny Youngbosch did such a great job in the role. 
But uh, what else? I thought the order was pretty generic. Their goals even more so. I still liked Kratos and his boss fight later. I thought that was really cool. Agnes fits the mold of the mad scientist too caught up in his work, but outside of his large bronze frame and his stuttered speech, I didn't think anything else of him. The Sanctus, eh, evil generic pope, been there, done that. Nero is the real star of this, even if we know literally nothing about him outside of his demonic origins. His energy and arrogance remind me of all the best things about Dante from DMC3, but I also admire his sort of sophisticated approach. Even if he has a sword that revs up like a motorcycle, what the fuck? He's got plenty of quips, but he's also dead serious about his work, and you can see that anytime he's put to the test. He gets shit done with little to no nonsense, so he doesn't feel like Capcom trying to pull a Poochie the dog in this scenario, who is, for all intents and purposes, a great protagonist, and I look forward to seeing what else they have in store for him, since I know he's brought back for DMC5. It's just, I find it so weird that for his first game, he's just some dude. Much better debut than Viola, though. Just gonna leave it at that. But fret not if you're thinking Dante doesn't get his share of screen time. He sure does, but man. I find it funny how the beginning of the game tries to play up Dante as this antagonistic force, and sure, from the perspective of Nero, he is. Oh man, is Dante going evil? But we know this ain't the case, and for me, it was the opening cutscene that told me that. Yeah, when he pulls out his piece and shoots Sanctus right in the fucking head, that's striking, startling even. But then he starts doing the usual Dante stick with the soldiers, stabbing them, swinging them around like a tool. Nah, he's not evil, the guys are just probably secretly evil or some other shit. I wish the story did a little more with that element of mystery instead of just brushing it to the side so quickly. This Gloria character, the horniest character to date in the franchise, yes, I think even more so than Nivana in DMC3, she's just a disguise for a returning Trish. Well, I'm happy to see her back as well as Lady. The story doesn't really like building to anything. Things are just laid bare and then we just move on. That was a thing. I kept saying that to myself until we reached the climax, and then I thought, dude, this is just the ending to Bayonetta. In fact, this is the game that Hideki Kamiya would research when making the very first Bayonetta game, and it's easy to see where. Bayonetta was constantly on my mind when playing this, and I think that sense of familiarity made my journey through the game easier to digest, but... Oh man, so the game is 20 missions long. For the first 10 to 11 missions, you play as Nero as you travel across the city, snowy mountains, random forests, what the hell is this? You slay demons, destroy bosses, big and small as you're trying to decipher the true purpose of the order. But as I'm playing the game, I'm noticing uh, a lot of bosses won't stay down or manage to make a retreat. We also seem to be building towards the climax pretty fast. We unlock Nero's devil trigger, he gets the Yamato to use, he discovers the insidious nature of the order, he has to save Kirie. Okay, we've reached the Sanctus at the base of his operations. Are we already at the end of the game? Pretty short if that's the case, but hey, I don't mind when my games are short. If anything, I hate when my games are overly long. But despite his best efforts, Nero is captured and then control switches to Dante for the remainder of the game. Keep in mind, we're well past the halfway point of the story by now, and most of Dante's missions compared to Nero are not anywhere as long, but I start playing as him. You know, I'm having fun. He's basically DMC3 Dante with multiple styles that you can freely switch between all willy nilly. In fact, before the Switch version of DMC3, this was the first game to have freestyle switching. So we could thank DMC4 for that. Thank you, DMC4. But then it starts hitting me. Oh, Dante's gameplay is just him going through the same places as Nero, but backwards. Oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not Devil May Cry doing the Castlevania bullshit. We're just going through the game backwards. Oh, here's the bosses that got away before, but now we got to fight them as Dante. We're playing the game twice in a single campaign. It's Devil May Cry, Co Veronica, say it ain't so, Devil May Cry. Oh. Oh lord, and what I find extra hilarious for Dante is that the game still has him acquire new weapons and guns, but you have next to no time to use them because you're almost done with the game, like, why bother at that point? I mean, the answer is the game's bloody palace, and I had a lot of fun with that this go around, but in the story, Dante feels very second bananas. And a likely result of him not being initially planned for the game in the first place. Okay, that's not entirely true. There was more planned for the guy, it's just the devs were over budget and out of time, so to make the game artificially longer to probably justify the price tag, they just had Dante go through the same locales and fight the same bosses, but in reverse. I will say now, this wasn't the worst thing to experience on my first run when I didn't know what to expect, but 
as I'm wrapping up my first playthrough, thinking about revisiting the game again with the extra characters because Special Edition brings us a playable Lady and Trish combo and Virgil, my mind was exhausted at the very thought of replaying the game an additional two more times. Shit, not even two. Uh, given how the campaign set up, I guess an additional four times. And now that I'm saying that out loud, since Virgil gets the whole campaign to himself, playing both the Nero and Dante sections, what, he reaches the Sanctus and he realizes he left his keys back in the city and has to go back to pick him up? Full Foolishness, Virgil. Foolishness, you fucking idiot. Man, this game left me split. The campaign itself I thought was middling, and I'm not even referring to like the back and forth shit, although this game will have you backtrack all the fucking time. It's the worst defender in the series so far with that shit. It's just, outside of the combat, there's nothing truly stand out regarding exploration and level design. Going through the motions sums up this game's design perfectly. They took out a lot of puzzles, and the ones that are here require little to no brain power to solve. We needed more grapple hook shit. I always get a rush of dopamine whenever I have a grapple hook in any game, uh, except this one for the record. As is, we only use it for some harmless climbing here and there. Maybe there's a spike ceiling on top, most times there isn't. It's a thing. I'm glad to see that the fixed camera wasn't as problematic as before. We even have a degree of camera control in certain spots now, so yeah, that's fine. You know what's not fine though? These gyro blades. Basically the game's equivalent of block pushing puzzles in RPGs that are so desperate to fill the time. And you gotta do it like fucking eight to nine times in one sitting. Two times, that's two. Does the game make you play this board game with this die, depending on the spot you land? You can either teleport ahead or backwards, land in a treasure spot, or fight a bunch of enemies. Even after being told how to manipulate the dice thanks to you guys in the Discord and Lewis, this shit is just intrusive. And to say again, they make you do it twice, the last one being a part of the fucking boss rush towards the end. Yet, you not only fight every boss as Nero, you not only fight them again as Dante, but then you gotta fight them for a third time as Nero when you get control of him again at the end of the game. Fucking stop dmc4 just ed please you'd be a better game if you did yeah i wasn't the biggest fan of this campaign but here's the real dick kicker for me gameplay wise i think this is the best one so far <laughs> Oh my god, this game's combat and control is simply sublime. Like regarding Dante, I'm happy to say I was able to jump into his gameplay with no issues because he's basically just DMC3 Dante with better graphics and questionable boots. A lot of the same tricks from before work just as well here, and even though you only get to use them for like two minutes, Dante's new set of weapons have their own kind of charm. Well, okay, well Gilgamesh is just the Beowulf and Ifrit gauntlets from before, and Lucifer was all right. I didn't find these very appealing because they didn't have the same impact as other weapons for me. Now Dante can make all the fucking sexual innuendos he wants with the weapon, but if I don't like it, I'm not using it. Get away from me, Dante. The Pandora is fucking ridiculous though, and I don't mean like in an overpowered way, I mean the damn suitcase transforms into a floating battle station kind of ridiculous. <laughs> what am I looking at here? But the real MVP is Nero, who I probably need a little more time to think about this fully, but I think he's the best character so far in the series just in terms of combat, utility, and ease of use. And that was the point of the character, so mission accomplished to the devs. Nero gives newcomers a way into the series without overwhelming them with all the options that Dante eventually musters. Nero doesn't get any new swords, he only has one fighting style and he only has one gun to boot, and his double trigger is more of a companion than a full blown transformation, but I think this ends up making Nero immediately more accessible and easier to fully grasp. For clarification, this doesn't mean Nero doesn't get upgrades at all but his ability payload is more focused and easier to understand, and I think that's an important distinction. I don't know why some of these abilities are labeled what they are. If you're gonna call it a side dash, just call it a side dash. What the fuck is Table Hopper? Nero's most standout asset is his glowing arm, the Buster, which confused the fuck out of me at first because I see the word Buster, it's a Capcom title, I'm thinking that was the name of Nero's gun, but no, it's just the name of his command grab. And what a fucking ability. Using his arm, right, Nero can yank opponents towards him, or if they're too big or heavy, he can close the gap and lay on the damage with his trusty sword. This does so much in making combat fluid and non-stop that there's never a dull moment with the guy. How I can just start some ground combos with the dude, then launch the enemy into the air, then do an aerial follow-up, then knock them down, then use the buster to pick them right back up and continue where I left off. God, that never got old. I genuinely felt like I was a demon slaying badass with Nero, and don't get me wrong, Dante and the others got that area covered in spades too, but with Nero, I feel more in control of my combos, it doesn't feel like button spamming and hoping for the best. The buster can even be used against stunned opponents for some more cinematic action. I love how they reference Street Fighter with at least a couple of these throws, and I appreciate the final atomic buster for the reference and wordplay. But especially against boss fights, these are just a fucking spectacle to see on top of dealing massive damage. My biggest regret with Nero is not fully 
fully grasping the power of his sword, the Red Queen. In addition to basic swordplay, you can also rev up the hilt like a motorcycle handle and charge the blade up, giving it explosive power like, say, a gun blade from a series I'm looking forward to revisiting later this year. Though you're free to charge the blade up at your leisure between battles, which I didn't find very fun to do looking back, slow progression down too much for my liking. Its real power lies in the Exceed ability, where with careful timing of the charge button, you can instantly unleash charge attacks in the middle of your combos. You do insane damage when you pull it off, but it's so fucking precise to fully master and I couldn't do it as often as I wanted to. Every time it went off though, I felt like a god, and seeing Nero's blade engulfed in flames was just cool to see. They also streamlined how abilities and items were acquired. Red orbs are now exclusively used for items at the store, so you no longer have to weigh between buying a skill upgrade or health pickup or permanent stat increase. Instead, you're rewarded with these proud souls whenever you finish a mission, and you use these to purchase new skills for your arsenal. The more skills you buy, the more expensive other upgrades will cost though, so you need to consider that when thinking about how you want to flesh out Nero's build, but DMC4 also allows you to refund proud souls so that you can reinvest it in another ability that you might want to try out later. And I think that's pretty neat. I didn't need to do that because I bought the bundle that essentially let me buy my way to a full move list from the get-go, but I still appreciate that design and giving players extra flexibility. And I also appreciate only needing to buy the double jump once instead of 5,000 times like the last game did. Yeah, I know I'm exaggerating, but I'm also bitter. But yeah, man, the gameplay is good. Whenever it was time to start smacking things, I was deeply enjoying myself. It was gratifying studying enemy patterns, learning to look for the right openings, maybe seeing if my buster could potentially interrupt things and jump at the sudden opening. On the ground or in the air, Nero was fucking killing it and it felt so good. I could have used less of these guys, Mephisto and Faust, they're just spamming the buster until you fully disrobe them and then you smack them for a bit before you gotta do it again. That ain't fun, that, that's just tedious. Also, fuck this Blitz guy. You know what I like doing in high octane combat games? Waiting. And that's what I felt like I was doing most of the time with this. You can't touch him when he's got that fucking electrical barrier up unless you're a god with Dante's royal guard. So you gotta pelt him with projectiles to the shields down and then pray to god you can kill him before it's back up. What a pain in the ass. Despite fighting most of them about three times a piece, the boss battles were fun too. Burial, I mean, he's just a Lionel from Zelda that's on fire. What's not to love about that? Uh, what do we got here? A bale, a demon frog that has a lesbian angler feeler, so lure unsuspecting prey? Okay, that uh, works for me. But whenever I hear his boss theme, I just think of Dropout from Dance Dance Revolution. They share similar samples. I'm checking the comment sections of this theme. Everyone was talking about how it sounds like a Dialga's theme from Pokemon. I was like, what? No, it's Dropout from DER. Echidna wasn't bad either, although I totally blanked on her name until I started writing this script, believe it or not. I just had her down as snake plant lady thing in my notes. I'm sorry, is, did, did she ever introduce herself? I don't recall. The fight against Kratos stands out as one of the best, I think. A perfect test of Nero's abilities while offering skill players the opportunity to cut things short in more ways than one. I have similar praise for the second fight against Dante as well, although I wouldn't put him on the same level as any of the Virgil fights from DMC3. Uh, then there's the final boss against the Savior and Sanctus. Uh, uh, these are all right. Savior, just too many pieces to the fight. Goes on longer than I wanted to. And it's not even the end because you got to fight Sanctus afterwards. And he's open for like two combos before he summons that barrier again. It's lather, rinse, repeat too soon for too long. An anticlimactic end to an already meandering story. And that was like the real like punch in the gut for me because I was so disinterested in revisiting the game front to back again and again that I didn't spend as much time with the other characters as I would have liked. And let me tell you, those extra characters, the Lady and Trish combo, the playable Virgil, hmm, they are great. First, it's great to see Lady actually being playable here. I thought that was like the most obvious thing to include last time, but better late than never. So I'm terrible at getting a decent ranking with her, but her focus on long range gunplay and explosives makes taking down even the most obnoxious goons delightfully fun, if a little rigid. She's like a souped up gunslinger style from DMC3. Not as acrobatic, but who needs aerobics when you have a gun? I managed to stick until the halfway point with Lady until it was time to switch to Trish, and I was ready to just try one battle with her and call it there, but then I actually started playing as her, and what is this girl's workout routine been? Her combo game with her fists, her lightning powers, the long and close range effectiveness with Sparta, holy shit, she wrecks so much shit in this game, it's amazing. But only for so long, because then I remember, wait, fuck, I don't want to do all this again, and then I just left the campaign. 
I ended up doing this with Virgil too. I get to the end of the first half with him and stop there because in my mind, I finished the game. I didn't want to do the whole thing again backwards with the same goddamn character, even if I was having the time of my life because, oh my God, Virgil is so fucking fun in DMC4. I love his sword combos, including the Yamato this time. It has combos worth a damn compared to DMC3. His summon swords are just plain unfair with proper spamming. His devil trigger is amazing. He has this concentration meter that fills up the more Virgil-like you approach your enemy and I mean, it's like slow walking towards them and decimating them with suit attacks. It looks silly, but like the damage does not lie. Oh my God, it's teleport. It's insane how much you can close the gap with it. I felt so relentless with it, especially against armor demons and boss battles. Virgil is seriously awesome in this game. It's just it's too bad about everything surrounding it. Thankfully, with the game's bloody palace, if you really want to, you can just jump straight into the combat with any of the characters here. And I did just that. I spent more time here than I thought I was going to actually in this mode because of just how much fun I was having in combat with everybody. Seriously, it has to be stressed again. In terms of gameplay, Devil May Cry 4 is such a step up from before. I love just playing this game. And like DMC3, I wish I had more time to try out different things or maybe try out some new costumes. At the same time, because the campaign is so middling, the very thought of revisiting any part of the game's story mentally exhausted me even more so than that of DMC2. If you remember back in that game, I played it multiple times with different difficulties just to see if I can get something else out of it. I did not feel compelled at all to do so with this game. Although don't misconstrue me, this is still a much, much better experience than that of DMC2. That remains a low point for me, but I just got so tired of this castle and the shit you do in it. Devil May Cry 4 gets my wholehearted recommendation on the gameplay alone. It's a wonderful, scrumptious improvement from a game that was already a substantial upgrade compared to the previous titles. The presentation and sound design have seen next-gen improvements, and the extra snazzy particle effects for combat and movement are so cool to see it right on the eyes. Uh, so I might get you know, flogged for this. I couldn't tell you anything about the music, though, sorry to say. The only standout theme for me was Nero's song, and that's only because you hear it every time you battle something. It's not like a Sonic the Werehog scenario where you get sick of it, but you'll hear, the time has come, and so have I, more times than you might think, and damn, all I can say is, Nero sure loves to come a whole bunch. Good lord, look at that face. Do you think he uses his glowing arm when he does it? And he, he Can he, like, rev up his dick? Here, for those hard-to-reach itches. Kyrie will love it. You catch my meaning? You know, even considering that we're four games in, and after all the bullshit that was DMC2's development, that uh, I thought that Capcom or the devs would never let circumstances get that bad again. Uh, to be fair, like DMC4's development didn't seem as bad as DMC2's, right? But you can still see cracks everywhere in this game, and it's mostly on the campaign because of just how boring it is. Like, it is a fucking fantastic game. I can't, I said that maybe seven times already at this point. But I mean, every single time, this was a phenomenally fucking fun game. And you, you got to play it based on that. But if they had a little extra time, if they had a little more uh, money to work with to solidify the, the, the campaign, the story mode, all that sort of shit, we could have had a, a contender for like one of my favorite games of all time, a character action or not. But, but we still have two other games after this. And maybe... Maybe with the next one, like, don't please stop laughing. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, but well, we're going to be taking a slight detour, I guess, with the next game, because the next game is DMC Devil May Cry, the series reboot. Well, I never played it, but I sure as hell know about it. And I guess we'll get my full 100 percent opinion on it. Uh, when next we, uh, when next we meet. So uh, with that said, uh, let's get to some more patron shout outs here. And we got a new list now. We've refreshed the list. We got some new names here and we're, we're, we're essentially starting over again. So on with more $10 patron shout outs. So okay, with a new list comes new names and more $10 patrons to shout out again. If you wanna get your name read by a YouTuber you like watching, you can become a $10 patron over at my Patreon. Or, you know, if that's too much, you can just become a $5 patron, get your name in the credits here, or just a, a dollar for a tip draw, whatever. I don't, big or small, I don't give a fuck. You're supporting the channel and I do greatly appreciate your patrons. Thank you very much. But anyway, uh, and again, I do apologize if I get some of these names wrong. As always, uh, Rezon Ace, Yui Mei, Sun Gohan, Timor Ahmed, Jack is back, Alex DBZ Movies, TJ Ryan, Aiden Smith, Spacious Wheat, Neolab, LOLY, 
<laughs> Harv's Games, Ryuka Kiryu, uh, Paisans, RH Taker 20, Schmitty, Zar Super Crazy, The Manitan, True Texican, Cobalt Dragon, Arcanist 729, Peacody Matt, Jennifer Grill, uh, Kaz Zora Tunic, Landon Ellerby, Engine and Tonic, Brandon W93, Dr. Tex, J Joyboy Fully, Milk Babe, It's Yos, Prowler, Portal Guy, Healing One 1997, uh, Caitlin, Raptor Wrangler, Cassandra Eater, Lars Russell, 8 Bit Bio, Dia 422, Anonymous Gamer, By 288, but, uh, 8 Bit Guy Caleb, Victory Star 527, Jerome Waters, Slant 16 Gamer, Montgomery U, Jorge Azul, James Martin Owen, uh, James Martin Owen, sorry, John Rutherford, Andrew Coleman, Shade Enigma, Flame Solus, uh, Doki Thug, Mario Fanboy 15, Brandon, uh, Itur is it, no, Iterald, why I fucked that one up, <laughs> Small Movie World, Cynic Alto, like Cynic Alto, I think that's how it is, Super Bro 64, ADD Monkey 55, Richie Inkwell, uh, J Dean, and finally for today, Metron, and it's spelled M3 Tron. I think it's pronounced Metro. Uh, as always, guys, thank you all for tuning in and watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night and take care.